Good morning to everyone. Let's start with the hearing number five of the 182 uh, regular period of session of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights titled Access to Justice for LGBTI Persons in Context of Violence in the Region, called by civil society organizations who are here, and I uh, greet. At this hearing, we also have the participant participation of Guillermo Fernandez Maldonado, representative of Mexico for the High Commissioner on Human Rights of the United Nations. I'm first Vice President, Julissa Mantisha, and I'm here with Flavia Piavenzan, second Vice President and a Special Rapporteur for LGBTI Rights, Commissioner Macaulay, Rapporteur for Women's Rights, and Commissioner uh, Arosema, Special for Rapporteur for Children's Rights. We also have Maria Claudia Pulido, Assistant Secretary. And before starting the hearing, I want to give some uh, precisions. We have a digital tool who will be measuring time for both parties. So I ask you that you are aware of that. We have a bilingual interpretation and subtitles, and these public hearings are being streamed live on YouTube and other platforms. Then I also ask you to have the cameras on and the mics off when you're not speaking. As for the time distribution, we will have a first round of 30 minutes in which the representatives of civil society can present their ideas and participate. After this 30 minutes, Maldonado, we will have, will have 10 minutes and afterwards the Inter-American Commission will have 30 minutes for comments and then we'll have a second round. After this, we will start and I ask you to introduce yourselves. Uh, I ask the civil society to participate for 30 minutes. You have the floor. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Carmen Anaya from the LGBTI Litigants Network of the Americas. Today, we will address the issue of access to justice for LGB LGBTI people in context of violence, for which I am accompanied by members of the Litigants Networks, the LGB uh, and Sex Workers Coalitions and the Network Without Violence. We are, our participation will be divided into three parts. First, an overview of violence against LGBTI people in the region, and then the situation of some countries in particular, and finally, the conclusions and recommendations. In relation to the general situation of violence in the regions, we can say that in the regional network, Sin Violencia, documented between 2014 and 2019, that more than 1,300 LGBT people had lost their lives. And uh, more people in Brazil, which equals one people, LGBT people uh, killed per day. 30% of those murders were motivated by the prejudice towards sexual orientation and gender identity of the victims. Of the total homicides reported between 2014 and 2019, 89% occurred in Colombia, Mexico, and Honduras, the latter being where the highest rate of violent deaths occur, followed by Colombia and El Salvador. These figures are linked to the generalized violence in the Central American region and in the Northern Triangle. But this is also affected by the weakness of the legal frameworks to guarantee the rights of LGBTI people. This suggests that violence disproportionately affects trans women, although there is underreporting and challenges in identifying cases for lesbian, bisexuals, and trans men who may be included in the murder figures of women. Prejudice is evident in a number of ways. First, due to excess in violence, some are tortured, raped, dismembered or burned. And second, due to the concentration of violence against certain parts of the body that are central to the expression of gender for sexually, for, for the victims, such as trans women who are disfigured in their face or the mutilation of genitals. Third, when sexual violence is carried out with the aim of modifying the sexual orientation of the work, victim. Fourth, when the violence is accompanied by insults or ridicule to seek to humiliate or denigrate. And finally, when the violence is generated because the sexual orientation or gender identity of the victims is made visible in the public space. For instance, when a couple displays affections in public or when a person is identified as trans due to their gender expression. 
now I will give the floor to my colleague from Belize so that he can report on his country. Okay. Uh, you're okay, okay, muted. okay. Okay. Um, my name is Caleb Orozco and I work with for the United Belize Advocacy Movement. 64.3% of CARICOM member states have ratified between five and nine international human rights treaty only. This signals a position in which sustained laws that justify violence and criminalization that affects hundreds of thousands across the region, a position that currently forces CSOs operating on the Eastern Caribbean states countries to organize strategic litigation in the regional court to eliminate criminalization laws that affect LGBT individuals. Belize remained inept at upholding effective enforcement of laws and non-discrimination practices under its civil and criminal justice system. Despite having a progressive constitution and two rulings that rendered our sodomy law unconstitutional in 2006, that was upheld in 2019 in our Court of Appeals. In addition, our ability to advance timely and effective adjudication, investigation, and criminal matters remains stagnant. As a country, Belize has met a civil war benchmark that have led to women and LGBT Belizeans to become collateral damage. The crime observatory, the state crime observatory remains reluctant to collect any data of LGBT Belizean skills over the past 10 years, noting the need to respect privacy. The state has failed to extend basic legal protection to LGBT individuals, such has been the case with the Domestic Violence Act. It has ignored the need for hate crime legislation. It has taken no position on how the Equal Protection Clause in our constitution applies to LGBT Belizeans. In May 2021, a 53-year-old gay man reported to our human rights observatory that the police department was turning him around with regards to a report of threat by an intimate partner. With great effort, the report was taken, but the lower court treated the case as an inconsequential matter and threw out the case. Problem identified include rights enforcement and protection mechanism remain inadequate, legal protection remain non-existence around economic rights, violence, and discrimination. There is no legal obligation for the state to collect data for a dead body or traumatized bodies as LGBT religions. Brasil. Bom dia. Meu nome é Paulo Iotti, sou gay, advogado de direitos. Good afternoon. My name is Paulo Iotti. I'm gay, a human rights lawyer. And I speak here on behalf of the group of lawyers for sexual and gender diversity. And ABGLT. We live in a banality of homotransphobic disease in Brazil as people feel they have the civil right to offend, discriminate, and even attack and kill LGBTI plus people. It is not true that Brazil is a good country to live in as LGBTI plus. Homotransphobic violence rates are high and are reported due to the state's unwillingness to map it out. There are no public policies to respect diversity in Brazil. The three national plans to combat homotransphobia and promote the rights of LGBTI plus population have never left paper. We have a true unconstitutional and unconventional state of affairs in the fight against homotransphobia in the country. The deficient structure of the public defender offices is an obstacle to access justice for LGBTI plus people in need with a special impact on transgender people. When LGBTI plus people are victims of crimes, there is often a homotransphobic inversion starting to be seen as suspects. This discourages complaints for fear of common police homotransphobia. This is aggravated in case of intersectionality of oppression, such as against uh, LGBTI plus black trans, uh, people. Homotransphobia having been recognized as a crime of racism by the Supreme Court in 2019 did not change the situation. We started to face the same difficulties as a Black movement in removing anti-racism law from paper. Access to justice demands a guarantee of justice with punishment of hate speech to individuals or groups, but often the judiciary fails to punish them, not recognizing such hate speech as punishable. I can easily cite recent, regrettably common cases. So despite the historic victories, 
with the STF, we urgently need to move forward. For example, a law that creates a system of social protection and reception um, protection, uh, GBTI plus people who are victims of homotransphobia. A Maria da Peña Act for LGBTI plus as proposed by Deputy David Miranda in Bill uh, 2653 of 2019. I asked for these and other measures in K329 of 2017. Brazil's complaints of homophobia still pending judgment by the Commission under a Blair case. The creation of more police stations specializing in hate crimes, at least in state capitals and key city cities, as they prove more capable and sensitive and can support non specialized ones. State mapping of homotransphobia cases with training and, um, of the justice system to fight them, expansion of public defender's office to guarantee assistance to LGBTI plus people in need, teaching anti-discrimination law and faculties focusing on anti-discrimination national inter-American jurisprudence, and there is a resistance from members of the justice system in complying with uh, STF decisions. I am at your disposal for the details. Thank you. Bolivia. Thank you. I am Fabio Schutz from the ADES Pro Libertad GLBT Organization of Bolivia. In the case of Bolivia, the collection of data about the state on violence against LGBTI persons is not uniform since there is no official database, as in the case of femicides. That makes this reality objectively visible and allows generating public policies according to it. According to a statement issued by the Ombudsman Office from 2006 to 2016, there was at least 64 cases of hate murders against the LGBTI population. These cases have increased along with other serious physical assaults. Civil society mentions more than 70 cases in which only two have a sentence. The most recent case was in the city of Cochabamba in February of this year and is still at the trial stage due to the work of organizations that use their own funds or volunteer work to promote the actions of the public ministry. Regarding the problem to access justice, we have the following. The family rejection of the victims of many of these cases, which contributed to their neglect by the competent authorities. The competent authorities have indifference, misinformation, and this creates inaction in cases of violence against LGBT people. Similarly, there is little credibility in the justice system. This is also partly associated with institutional violence, where state securities and health service centers commit violent acts against LGBT people, especially against trans people. The lack of statistical data by the state prevents an adequate measurement of the problem and the formulation of public policies in this regard. Now, as regards Paraguay, According to the information provided by Irania, civil society between November 2020 and October 2021 registered a total of 240 cases, mainly of discrimination based on sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression. They had like the context related to coming out, violence, harassment, and persecution due to sexual orientation, gender identity, or gender expression. In 2020, during the pandemic, there was a 60% increase in the number of calls reporting cases of discrimination. Irena maintains that in 2020, there has been a worsening of the crisis at the health, economic, and political level, and discrimination and violence worsened during the COVID-19 pandemic with a deepening of injustice. Moreover, discrimination persists in stalling public institutions when operators or justice operators are involved and also uh, limit the access to justice. I would like to give the floor to the candidate or the representative of Ecuador. My name, I am Fernanda Bernarda Freire from Pacta and Sendas Organization. The violent deaths of LGBTI persons are a special urgency in Ecuador. The Monitoring Commission for Violent Deaths of LGBTI Persons in 2017 pointed out that out of the 48 cases, only eight obtained a conviction for homicide or murder. 25 are under prior investigation and three have been closed. Uh, the commission has diagnosed as 
this is a critical issue due to the lack of statistics. The commission also uh, indicated that there are few statistics uh, regarding the reported cases and there is a lack of monitoring of the trans persons cases, which are no longer investigated. In Ecuador, hate and discrimination crimes are classified, but um, the results regarding violence against LGBTI persons has not changed. Until 2021, there was no conviction regarding these crimes against LGBTI persons. The measures adopted, adopted by the state regarding access to justice for LGBTI persons are insufficient. People do not feel safe filing complaints or legal actions because justice operators are not trained. The judicial processes do not progress and LGBTI persons are uh, have their rights violated at the judicial sphere. Other barriers include the lack of education and the adequate treatment pro protocols when filing a complaint and within the investigation process, the re-victimization of LGBTI persons, their identities and their sexual orientations are ignored and they are exposed to negligent and offensive attitudes on the part of justice operators. All this discourages the presentation and the monitoring of the judicial proceedings and prevents um, um, violations suffered by LGBTI people from stopping. Now I would like to give the floor to my colleague from Peru, Amelida Guerra from NGO From Sex. In Peru, there is a lack of due diligence that LGBTI people face when they are victims of violence and or discrimination. In these cases, there are no specialized protocols in the justice system for the attention of victims or for the investigation into the facts, especially when the victims are LGBTI children and adolescents. Furthermore, access to justice is hampered in the following cases, when efforts to clarify the crime focus on the investigating the lives of the victims to downplay the cases, when institutions are unaware of the gender gender identity of trans women due to the stereotypes, prejudice, prejudice and re-victimization during the investigation. Also the negligence of the authorities and the inadequate assessment of the evidence and because of the unnecessary delay of the judicial proceedings. The situation described can be seen in the case of Jeffrey, a trans woman who suffered torture and in the case of Azul Rojas Marin against Peru. Although in March 2020, the Inter-American Court declared that the Peruvian state was responsible for this case, a final judgment is still pending at the domestic level, which determines the criminal responsibility of the police officers for the torture and sexual violence, violence they executed. Also, it is necessary to prosecute the officials who obstructed the investigations on the basis of prejudice and to comply with the reparations ordered by the court, such as the adoption of investigation and prosecution protocols for these cases. In addition, there is a lack of laws and policies in Peru for LGBTI persons' access to justice. Also, there is a concern regarding the fact that the murder of trans women are not investigated on suspicion of feminicide due to the application of the plenary agreement of the judicial power that raises a restrictive interpretation of the passive subject of the crime. I would like to give the floor now to my colleague from Colombia. Good morning. I am Juan G. Felipe Rivera from the NGO Colombia Diversa. During the last five years in Colombia, the number of murders of LGBTI persons has remained constant, while the national homicide rate has decreased. In 2020, 738 LGBTI persons were victims of homicide, threats, and police violence. Between 2017 and 2020, attacks against 177 LGBTI defenses were recorded. Convictions, convictions are usually less than 10%. Some problems are access to justice for LGBTI persons are the following. There are prejudice and problems in receiving complaints. Trans people are called by names and genders that do not uh, correspond to their identity. In the case of migrants, there are fears such as a resistance to report for fear of suffering deportation. Second, the criminal type of discrimination is, mutual, is, is not usually prosecuted in cases of violence 
third, the slow action of justice. Four, the Office of the Public Prosecutor transfers the responsibility of promoting the criminal investigation and the border of the process to those who represent the victims. Five, there are problems in the evidence assessment, as well as in the formulation of research hypotheses on violence against LGBTI persons. For example, in the case of Alvaro Miguel Rivera, for example, the criminal behavior unit characterized the victim as a high risk victim due to her unstable relationship, accidental sexual partners who were allowed to enter her home and her HIV status along the, uh, with unprotected sex. Finally, the special jurisdiction for peace has not established a macro case on acts of sexual violence, reproductive violence, and other crimes motivated by the victim's sexuality, which undermines access to justice for LGBTI people. We deeply regret the inaction of this unit on security matters. Victims represented by organization Colombia Reversa in the macro case of the Costa de Nariño since 2020 face kidnappings, beatings, torture, and threats, and some have, some have even died waiting in the health services. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Amaranta Viridiana from X Justicia for, for Women in Mexico, and I will speak on behalf of uh, the my colleagues from the organization Letter S and the Red de Juventudes Trans de Mexico. In our country, there are no official data on violence against LGBTIQ plus people. The existing information is collected by human rights organizations or civil society organizations. In Mexico, 94% of LGBTI plus persons have witnessed or experienced hateful expressions, physical attacks, and harassment. From 2015 to 2020, there was an upward turn in the number of murders against LGBTI persons, adding 520 victims, cases such as those of Pablo Taola Buenrostro and Kenya Cuevas show obstacles in the investigation of the crimes of prejudice against these trans women. In 2016, Paola Buenrostro, a trans woman, was murdered in Mexico City by a man who hired her sexual services. The prosecution began an investigation for homicide in which it refused to recognize the gender identity of the victim and her transgender companions. Likewise, they were denied information because they were not relatives. Uh, she was considered just one more whore without even being able to go to the bathroom. After this, Kenya Cuevas presented the complaint to 2019 before the Ombudsperson of Mexico City, which was resolved in her favor, dictating comprehensive reparation measures, including a recommendation to redesign the protocol of action for the care of the LGBTI community. Compliance with this recommendation is still pending with re-victimization obstacles because of the actions of the authorities. Other obstacles suffered by LGBTI persons when they had to access to justice include the following. There is no regulation that guides the actions of police, prosecutor, experts, experts, and judicial operators for the recognition of gender identity or sexual orientation. There is a repeated non-observation of the Belen of the Do Dopara Convention and also of the Inter-American Convention Against Any Form of Discrimination and Intolerance. There are no approved administrative procedures in the country for the identity change process. There is a lack of legislation on prejudiced crimes throughout the country, as well as protocols for their investigation and judicial processing. There is also difficulty in proving the motivation of hatred in judicial proceedings. And also there is discrimination by motivated by sexual orientation and gender identity within the prosecutor's offices. Now, Dominican Republic. I am Christian King of the organization Transa Trans Siempre Amigas. In the Dominican Republic, the state does not generate statistics on murders or crimes against LGBTI persons. There is no informa information related to the rulings or investigations in cases of violence motivated by gender identity. The only statistics that exist on crimes against LGBTI people are from civil society. Since 2016, trans have, have documented 49 crimes against trans people, of which only five had final convictions. From 2014 to 2021, a total of 52 murders of LGBTI persons were recorded out of which 24 are of trans women, seven from uh, include lesbian women and 21 gay men. In addition, there are risks 
uh, pushback in Congress, the penal code that is pending eliminates that the articles or sections that would sanction hate crimes, discrimination related to sexual orientation and gender identity. Additionally, moral and religious conscientious objection is proposed as the justification for discrimination. In addition, in judicial proceedings, trans people must identify themselves with their legal name. Also in the prosecution, conflicts between same sex couples are not recognized as cases of gender violence, even if the victim is a trans woman. Finally, in 2018, the Dominican state established a national human rights plan. In 2019, the Office of the Public Prosecutor Office uh, would have documented cases related to hate crimes, but so far, nothing has happened, despite the fact that the civil society provided a list of the cases. Now I would like to give the floor to my colleague from El Salvador. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Carly Nemus from Comcavis from El Salvador. El Salvador is the fifth most violent country in Latin America and the second at the level of Central America. Many deaths involve the use of firearms. This has been recorded in five out of every eight murders against LGBTI persons. The most affected population is trans women and gay male, men. The age range of the victims is between 22 and 50 years. Data shows that there is a trend to leave the bodies in public spaces, even more so when they have been tortured or mutilated. And this leaves a clear message about the repudiation of the lives of LGBTI persons. El Salvador has a law for victims of forced displacement since 2018. Concavin Strands has us provided support for 41 cases of displaced persons, 31 cases of people at risk of displacement, a total of 75 cases in the first seven months of 2021. Due to the lack of a state response and the lack of security guarantees, murders are unleashed due to the settle or, or due to retaliation against LGBTI persons. Cases usually start with harassment and threats, which lead, to, which lead to forced displacements and murders. In addition, El Salvador maintains context of structural violence, since institutions do not articulate actions to address violence against LGBTI persons, and they do not provide support or monitoring of the crimes motivated by sexual orientation and gender identity. For this reason, there is a huge concern that the Bukile government abolished five state secretariats at the beginning of, its, of his term, including the social inclusion secretariat uh, that addressed the situation of LGBTI persons. Now I would like to talk about the situation in Honduras. Uh, for the Catrachas organization, the state of Honduras has been characterized by negligence in promoting the investigation, promote, prosecution, and punishment of crimes committed against LGBTI persons. According to the Observatory of Violent Deaths of Catrachas, the lack of technical capacities and the lack of knowledge about violence due to prejudice against LGBTI persons is one of the causes of impunities in cases of lethal violence. From the coup d'etat of 2019 to September 2021, the observatory records 399 deaths, of which 47 people uh, are lesbians, 120, 123 are trans women, and 229 are gay men. Out of all these cases, only 85 have been prosecuted, and only 30 five have a final conviction. 91% of the cases of violent deaths of LGBTI persons went unpunished. In criminal matters, the only relevant progress made had to do with the approval of legislative or the passing of legislative decree 23-2013, which included sexual orientation and gender identity as an aggravating factor in some criminal offenses. Although this amendment was conducted, its application or enforcement has not been effective. In the 35 convictions recorded, none of them has applied that aggravating factor. This lack of application or enforcement of the norm has to do with the lack of training of justice operators, the lack of investigation protocols on violent death of LGBTI persons and the prejudice established uh, among those said officials. 
My name is Mirta Moragas from the LGBTI and Sex Workers Coalition. I would like to talk about the recommendations and conclusions. The realities described above allow us to conclude that there is not a unified model of action in cases of violence due to prejudice. As the Inter-American Court has indicated in the cases Azul Rojas Marin versus Peru and Vicky Hernandez against Honduras, the states must adopt protocols for investigation and administration of justice during criminal proceedings for cases of LGBTI violence. These protocols should be address uh, the situation of public officials involved in the investigation and processing of criminal proceedings, as well as uh, public and private health personnel who participate in the investigations. The adoption of a specialized investigation and sanction protocols should have as a main objective the identification of common stereotypes and misconceptions about LGBTI persons that tend to hinder investigation, the attention, and the collection of evidence in a timely manner. In addition, they must propose that from the very beginning, the reason of the crime be examined, considering the investigative hypothesis of prejudice, which allows for the application of the specific criminal type and also the corresponding aggravating factors without the need for the victim of their family to insist on their inclusion. The elaboration of this model protocol must incorporate the knowledge of multiple disciplines, forensic medicine, criminology, law, psychology, sociology, and should be the product of a joint work between key actors such as police agencies, the Office of the Public Prosecutor, Judiciary, and the Ministries of Justice. Since the state have also good practices, including countries such as Argentina, Colombia, Mexico, Peru, and the Dominican Republic, a republic among others. If the commission is interested, we could talk about the best practices that we have identified. In addition, we believe it's important that we have the participation of national and international organizations and institutions and LGBTI plus organizations so that they can contribute with their knowledge and experiences. The civil society has pointed out the gaps and mistakes in the judicial proceedings in order to give clues about how the proceedings and investigations should have been carried out. For our networks, it's important not only to report the problem, but also to have the opportunity to promote dialogue. This is an invitation to join forces and promote a Latin American protocol model for the investigation and prosecution of cases of violence against LGBTI persons that is general in accordance with international standards on human rights that provides practical guidelines for the adaptation of the actions of the different uh, bodies, police, forensic bodies, fiscal and judicial authorities, and that is adaptable to the institutional framework of each country. Thank you to the representatives of civil society for your presentation and for how you organize everything. I would like to give the floor to Guillermo Fernandez for 10 minutes. Good morning. It's a pleasure to participate in this uh, hearing as a representative of the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights of the United Nations. Without un, uh, being under oath on the situation of human rights of lesbians, trans people, transgender, bisexuals, and other identities uh, comprised in the LGBTI plus, plus uh, per persons in the context of violence in the region. None of my comments should be understood as a waiver of the 1946 uh, Charter of the United Nations. The current context of discrimination uh, makes LGBTI people vulnerable. The pandemic has increased homophobia and transphobia. Some countries even established uh, limitations based on sex, which placed uh, non-binary people and trans people in vulnerable situation. In Panama, for instance, there were uh, measures to arrest or denigrate uh, people from these uh, populations. Rights to health, housing, work or food were equally affected for them. In the last couple of years, there were some legal advancements as well. For instance, uh, same uh, gender marriage recognized in four countries, some who have incorporated LGBTI rights to their constitution, five of them recognizing same-sex couples, two countries with uh, 
specific measures and nine countries guaranteeing self-identified uh, identity. But there's still a gap between culture and institutions. According to a report, prejudice know nothing of borders. 1,900 people were murdered in Latin America between 2014 and 2020 from this population. I want to focus on Honduras, Guatemala, Mexico. Honduras has recorded 300 violent deaths a month. This affects disproportionately people in vulnerable situations such as the LGBTI plus population. The observatory of the Catapetas organizations reported 26 uh, of these deaths in this year. And the pandemic and the hurricanes, climate change has increased discrimination and inequalities. There are no legal guarantees for the non-discrimination of this population. The criminal code has widened uh, this recognition, but only the rights of women and men are protected. There are no validations for uh, the unions of same-sex couples who are celebrated and recognized in other countries and prohibits the adoption of children for marriages of, made up of same-sex couples. There's an obligation for trans people to maintain their legal name, which is different to the name they identify with. There was a constitutional reform that incorporated a prohibition for abortion and that requires the modification of 112 uh, art article that there is a qualified majority in the Congress. LGBTI people face obstacles to access justice, such as stereotypes in police stations and tribunals that discriminate them and creates a lack of confidence in the justice system. According to the observatory, out of the 26 violent deaths this year, only four of them are under investigation. And the Inter-American Court uh, condemned uh, Honduras with the death of Vicky Hernandez and the sentence requires due and uh, swift uh, incorporation and adoption of the recommendations. So there are obstacles to, re to uh, guarantee the rights of LGBTI people and three of them are key to adopt a procedure to recognize gender identity so that there is uh, correct identity cards according to the self-perceived uh, identity to adopt justice mechanisms for LGBT people who are victims of violence and to create a plan of ongoing training for justice operators for these cases. In the case of Guatemala, the annual reports of our office point out that the LGBTP uh, people are still discriminated and isolated. According to a visibleless organization, violence is in schools, in jobs, in state environments. It's an invisibilization of these people, and there's a lack of development of public policies, which uh, infringes their rights to have access to justice. There are no laws to protect against gender-based discrimination or for the gender expression. According to an observatory here in Guatemala, from January to October this year, six, 17 gay men had been murdered, seven trans women, trans women and two bisexual men. Trans Reina La Noche organization registered 194 cases of violence against trans women and seven against trans men. There are no adoptions of uh, mechanisms for the rights of LGBT people. There is a law to guarantee the comprehensive protection for children against gender, uh, gender violences. Several special rapporteurs sent a letter to the government to warn that adoption of this initiative would be a serious back, uh, backlash for the rights of uh, LGBTI people and for the compliance of international 
meshes. There's also recognition of a single traditional family model, and this also violates the rights of LGBTI people. The national police, the public prosecutor's office have not yet are yet to incorporate meshes to protect LGBTI people. And this year, the statistics by the public prosecutor's office from 2016 to 2019 there show no convictions for gender-based violence. There were only four convictions in the last years. So to summarize, there are still some important challenges ahead. There is a lack of protocol. There is a need to strengthen investigation and the uh, training of those who receive the reports. In the case of Mexico, the violence against this population includes uh, conversions, therapies, uh, hate crimes, sexual violence, especially against trans people. According to the National Observatory of Crimes Against These People, only 10 out of the 32 Mexican states have re reported 40, uh, 54 cases of violence against them. And this happens despite of important legislative progression in several of these states, such as uh, the recognition of same-sex couples. And I want to focus on the case of Veracruz. There were 192 victims of these populations. There are torture, affix, uh, sexual abuse, etc. And 70% of those victims were sexual workers. 40% of them were uh, in common, uh, were placed in common public spaces. And only 5% of those cases are still uh, at trial. Most of the cases are still impugn. There are two cases I want to focus. The action protocol of those who administer justice for uh, cases involving LGBTI uh, violence, which wants to include gender perspective and also the creation of a group to investigate trans femicide, trans femicide in Mexico. And I want to go to three points. The challenges are this to strengthen the justice system to understand a gender perspective to strengthen the cases to protect lgbti people and to eliminate stereotypes in the legal system to fight against the violations is key for all states we will be uh, providing support in all the region and we will be providing support on the basis of leaving no one behind, which is part of the 2030 agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, of the representative of the OHCHR. Now I give the floor to Commissioner Pla Flavia Provesan, second vice president and special rapporteur of the LGBTI rights. Thank you very much, first vice president, dear colleague, Julis, Julisa. I greet my colleagues, uh, Commerce uh, Commissioner Margaret, my dear sister, and Commissioner Esmeralda, our dear Assistant Executive Secretary, uh, Maria Claudia Pulido, and the representative of the United Nations, uh, Guillermo Maldonado, and all of the civil society present today, which organized and articulated very well that presentation. Also, I want to uh, recognize and give my gratitude to your voices, to your experiences, and especially for your uh, capability to change suffering and pain into struggle for dignity, for respect, and for rights. I really respect 
your experiences. And I think that as the civil society for the struggle for the rights of LGBTI people is a regional power. It's the driver for this case, a very challenging cause, which has achieved something, especially due to this uh, stubborn struggle you carry forward. And also I want to thank your giving us uh, this uh, overlook of all these different uh, regions and countries, such as uh, from the Caribbean, Brazil, Peru, Colombia, Mexico, Dominican Republic, El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, and other regions. We see uh, some common points and also some uh, differences. I have the honor to be the special rapporteur for LGBTI persons. And I would say uh, I work with my dream team. So I have the honor to participate in this challenge alongside Miguel Mesquita, Manuel, Jessica. And also now we've been joined by our Anderson from the Caribbean to strengthen this team. And at the rapporteurship, we have three areas, uh, main focuses. The struggle against the discrimination and against violences and to uh, promote a new culture, a new paradigm that is uh, cultural changes always with the stance of uh, human rights and state obligations that is the right of a right of a life that is free of violences which implies the adoption of all due diligence to prevent investigate prosecute sanction and reparate violence so at the rapporteurship we always have this reasoning behind our work to focus on the dimension of each right especially on uh, state obligations and at the center, we have the right to be. That is the, the core, the essential core of human rights, which is the right to be in and of itself, and which is a condition, a requirement for the, ex, for the uh, observance of the rest of the rights. Now we are updating the 2015 report of the region which uh, addresses the violence against the LGBTI persons. I had the honor to present at the OAS and the UN in 2019 about the recognition of the LGBTI uh, persons' rights. And we are finishing a report on cultural changes for the rights of LGBTI persons. We have the advisory opinion 24617 as regards same-sex uh, uh, marriages. We uh, see these uh, conquests such as the one in Chile last week. And we also address uh, inter-American jurisprudence for over 10 years. In February 2012 was the first case and we started developing all this step by step. And I have the honor to represent the Inter-American Commission with my dear colleague, uh, Joel Hernandez in November last year in the case Vicky Hernandez. So I would love to hear from the civil society as regards the three answers to three regional challenges. The first one, is if there are any best practices in this tag in collecting data statistics, especially disaggregated data. We always insist on disaggregated de data at the rapporteurship because we need to make visible the vulnerabilities. We need to reject indifference towards the differences. And because we need to have disaggregated data to create evidence, to characterize direct and the disproportionate impact that suffer, for instance, trans women and also foster by the on the part of the state focused state policies. I always think of the situation of a gay man, for instance, who lives at an, an apartment 
uh, face in Central Park in New York, which is completely different from a, a situation of an Afro-descendant trans woman that lives in a rural area in Bolivia. Both of them are part of the LGBTI community, but there is a completely different situation. This is why the commission seeks to have an intersectional approach so that we can demand from the state the duty to special protection. So I would love to hear if there are any practices at the region in the region, because I think the commission is at a very strategic position to have this uh, approach from 35 countries and to identify good practices to inspire the rest of the countries. Point number two, Merta, I would love to take your proposal to delve deeper into this idea that I find key, which has to do to foster an inter-American protocol to investigate and to administer justice uh, in the face of uh, crimes against uh, LGBTI persons. We have the experience from uh, women with gender uh, perspective. And I think that we have the court, Inter-American Court vision in the cases of Azul Rojas and Vicky Hernandez. So I completely agree with you. The commission fosters processes and we always have, uh, we always have a democratic participation. We always hear different voices. Also, I think it's key here to have a model to protect the uh, right to gender identity. We have good best practices in Uruguay, in Argentina, yes. But how can we foster this? And finally, uh, as regards training, because I think this is essential. I learned from you that violence against LGBTI persons has a cultural and structural component. It's hate and prejudice violence. If this is based on prejudice, we have to dismantle prejudice by fostering cultural changes. So there are courses, programs, and training programs which have to be key to create new perspectives, new points of view, especially taking into account con contexts. So I conclude my three points by reaffirming my commitment I'm here, here very moved because in December this year, uh, my term ends. I had the honor to serve here at the Inter-American Commission. And from the moment I came here, I always said I would like to serve the, the special rapporteurship on LGBTI rights because I have a deep belief that the right to be is the core of all human rights. And also, we, I second the inter-American opinion that we have the right to confess meaning to our existence according to our, to our rights. There are no other rights in this finite life, this precarious life, other than freedom, self-determination, to provide sense to our existence. So I really, really thank you for everything you've done. It's an honor, I'll be your ally in other areas, but here publicly, I reaffirm my commitment in, the, in this struggle to the right of being. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Piovesan. I would like to give the floor to Commissioner May Macaulay, that is Rapporteur for Women's Rights. Uh, good morning, um, Madam President. Um, can you hear me? Yes? Thank yes. Um, good morning, Madam President. Good morning. Uh, sister, Madam President, and good morning, Sister Flavia, good morning, Sister Esmeralda, and good morning to all of you, um, the strong defenders of the rights of LGBTI and 
on the status of communities in our various um, countries in our region. And this, uh, it always saddens me when we have a session on, on um, LGBTI uh, persons, um, because the, there never seems to be, to my mind, real advances um, in the protection of their rights. Um, and rather a lot of violence and regressions um, seem to be on the increase. Um, if, if, um, uh, even I should not trespass and deal with my country of Jamaica, but that was always a very worrying situation, uh, uh, lots of violence. Um, but every now and then it seems to go into remission. And it seems to me from following the news and so on there, that it is in remission at the moment. But um, I'm sure um, Caleb can tell us better about that um, um, from the Caribbean point of view. But I, I am so happy actually that we are in, moving in this direction to um, update the 20, uh, 2015 report. Um, um, so that we can have uh, have and present the true, true position and picture of what has been happening since 20, that report was, was launched and published in 2015. And, and assist states by recommendations in that report as to what they ought to do to, moving forward to protect the rights of the LGBTI. Um, communities, and um, especially to highlight the regressions which have been um, going on. Um, at the, my, my rapporteurship on women's rights, we received reports of a serious increase in violence and intensity and ferocity, uh, um, um, especially those meted out to trans women of all races, but particularly in relation to Afro-descendant trans women, the reports we, we receive is that, um, especially those in, in sex work, is particularly vicious in the violence um, against them, both from state, um, state agents and also from private uh, um, citizens. Um, so we really have to highlight this, this position. And of course, uh, um, uh, those in rural communities are even worse off. Um, what, 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 it's difficult to say worse off. They are in a seriously bad position. I, am, I echo my, sis, my sister Flavia's um, request um, 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 that she's made, um, the, the three areas. I don't want to waste time to, to repeat it so that others can speak. But I pray that um, uh, the work that you're doing, which is so valuable, and especially partnering with the commission in this, this work, will lead us to be able to get all states to see that they have to take every single action to ensure that all persons within their borders, especially the LGBTI and those of, of other vulnerable groups live lives of true dignity. This is the basic thing that they must do and that we must hold them to. And they, so they therefore have to ensure that the judiciaries have the proper mindset and training and knowledge with cases, investigation and cases related to them and their police force. And I think when these agencies of government fail to ensure justice and protection, that a hard core reaction must be taken by the state, which is lacking at the moment. And because most states are not, do not castigate a judge who is unjust in an L LGBTI case, nor do they do anything specific to a police officer who attacks an LGBTI person who happened to cross their path or 
to who uh, goes with a complaint to them. And I think states will must enjoin states that they must act in this way because they are uh, um, infringing and endangering, further endangering the safety of LGBTI persons by not taking a hardcore position against the violence against them. Thank you very much. Um, I wish you all very successful work and um, and I hope you can have some time um, over the holidays and that it will be peaceful and violent free of all LGBTI persons in our region. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. I would like to give the floor to Commissioner Rosemena and Rapporteur for Mexico. You are on mute, Commissioner. Thank you, President of this hearing, Commissioner Julissa. I would like to greet also my sisters, Margaret and Flavia. I would like to especially recognize the work you are all doing. As Margaret was saying, this is a possibility for the Commission. It supports our work because of your contribution. I would like to thank the representative of the High Commissioner Office. Thank you for presenting all those concepts because those concepts include the actions that we need to promote, to foster, and towards the end of each period of sessions in the Commission, Flavia is ending her term. I don't know who will be in charge of the LGBTI persons rapporteurship, but for sure, we are all committed to ensuring the momentum of the rapporteurship, uh, thanks to the work of Commissioner Flavia. You have provided us with valuable information. I truly congratulate you for this work because having uh, information on what's happening across the continent, it's key. Um, you are able to identify and to produce information and collect information in spite of the barriers and challenges. I would like to know how you are, are working on two things. First, how you are addressing the situation of children in LGBTI Q plus groups. Children are especially vulnerable group because of their age. age is a vulnerable aspect in itself because children depend on their parents, on the authorities, on their teachers. And identifying the identity or the situation of children under these conditions is important. I would like to know if you have any specific information or data regarding how uh, violence against children takes place within the LGBTI community. The information that we have is that there is a high risk situation and we see that there is a high risk of suicide among children of LGBTI communities because of the rejection that they suffer even within their own families. So I would like to know how you are assessing the situation of children in LGBTI communities and the information that you have. And the second aspect that I would like to know more about uh, is related to something that is personal, a personal concern of mine. 
I would like to know what this course or should we have uh, in order to promote training? Are we facing cultural patterns? Are these the realities of a population that is not fundamentalist? Why there is so much hatred in society? This has not has nothing to do with faith or with the doctrine. I am Christian. I'm Catholic, and my faith tells me tells me that I should love the other. But I cannot hate others. I need to understand others. Margaret was talking about dignified lives. Our faith tells us that we should live lives in dignity. That we should have a life of dignity taken into consideration the purpose of our creator. Uh, the Bibles reads this, we are all born equal. So this concept of hatred, I don't know if that's based in uh, morality. I don't know if that's morality. I don't know if this has to do with the fact that you are rejecting your own life because otherwise you cannot reject others with so much hatred. And this affects so the lives of so many people as the cases that you have shared with us today. We see that they are being martyred, but they are also living lives full of discrimination, full of violence in all the spaces, in all the spheres. So my question is, what this course should we prepare so that the training for judicial operators and other agents that should be permanent, they should include a component that proves effective, effective that actually reaches the hearts of all the recipients of that training so that we can actually overcome the situation. I don't see the clock. I probably uh, went beyond my time, but I would like to echo Flavia's proposal. I think that we need to work together to join efforts uh, and to give momentum to this initiative. I would like to say that I fully committed to working to guarantee the transforming impact of our actions. That's what's necessary. And that's the legacy that Commissioner Flavia is leaving us. Thank you. Sorry, Commissioner, don't worry. And everything is very well coordinated. So we have six minutes left. So we are fine in terms of time. I would like to make the most of the six minutes that we have left. I would like to thank uh, all the information provided by civil society organizations. And I have some specific questions in some countries. Uh, Fernando Mal, uh, Guillermo Maldonado was talking about this. Uh, we know that some countries have laws and legislation while others do not have, uh, but we know that there is a gap between law and practice. And I would like to know if there are any jurisprudence, many of the rights uh, earned by the LGBTI communities um, are because of rulings. And we know that there are backlashes or regressions. And I would like to know the current situation because 
uh, we can earn rights, but there are also regressions. So I would like to know how we can monitor this situation. And we, you were also, uh, I would like to know if there are LGBTI persons are working in different positions in the administration of justice and if there are any policies or public policies to promote their inclusion in the judiciary or in justice administration uh, areas. I don't know if you have uh, thought about that possibility. And the third question has to do with violence and feminicides. Uh, after the case of Vicky Hernandez against Honduras, the commission talks about the application of the Belen do Pará Convention for trans women, I would like to know if there are there is any legislation, for example, we have the law against violence or the different concepts of feminicide. I would like to know if there is any jurisprudence uh, regarding the application or the enforcement of laws to the cases of trans women. And I would like to know what's happening with trans men. Um, talking about legislation, but I'm also talking about sexual and reproductive rights of trans men, including um, the interruption of pregnancy. Um, Mirta, please send us all the information that you have since you're coordinating this group of organizations. I would close the presentation of the commission and I would like to give the floor to the civil society so they have 20 minutes to react. Thank you, commissioners. We will start answering your questions and making comments about some of the best practices that we have identified. We would like to say that in 2021 in Argentina, the Buenos Aires Public Prosecutor Office adopted a protocol for the investigation and prosecution of cases of feminicide and also uh, crimes related to gender identity and sexual orientation. Also, these included the cases of LGBTI persons. Uh, this is an adapted version or draft of that protocol used to investigate murders against LGBTI trans women. And it was created by the Office of Women of the Public Prosecutor Office of Argentina. This protocol was created with the support of the High Commissioner of the United Nations. They supported also the issuance of the Latin American Protocol on Feminicide. And that's something that we would like to talk about today. We also identified best practices in Peru. Sorry, can you hear me? Or you have a question? Alida, you have the floor. Okay. In Peru, we have three best practices that we would like to highlight. First is the guidelines for LGBTI persons, especially within the Office of Services for Victims of Violence and Vulnerable Women. This uh, protocol in or includes also um, gender protection for cases of violence, including also the situation of LGBTI persons. Also, the Office of Human Rights adopted also the inclusion of LGBTI persons in social services for victims of violence. And uh, this includes the supply of legal representation for victims of violence, including LGBTI persons. And third, we have uh, seen that there are differentiated actions in regarding the implementation of the program for LGBTI persons and women. And this was uh, conducted by um, one of the commissions regarding the armed conflict in Peru. Belize, you have the floor now, Belize. Regarding the model, we have the only, and all, let's see, we have an LGBT-led human rights observatory in Belize that is CSO managed, not by the state. We collect data and, and we're the only observatory that collect data, provide litigation, provide legal advice and promote the defense of LGBT uh, individuals as they come our way. The state uh, and uh, separately, 
uh, in the HIV sector in particular, we have been able to partner with the uh, HIV Commission to create a national working group to advance reform around an equal opportunity bill and hate crime legislation. That's the first, if we can get it done in 2022, for Belize to be uh, the first Caribbean country uh, to have those legislation that is inclusive of sexual orientation and gender identity and includes. Colombia. Sí, muchas gracias. Eh, en Colombia tenemos varias buenas Felipe. prácticas. In Colombia, we have several best practices. We would like to highlight the following. First, there is a model on the rights of lesbian, gays, and trans and intersex persons. And it collects the jurisprudence and the best practices uh, regarding LGBTI persons and includes also some protocols for judges. And the last five years, um, there was a standstill regarding that program. Also, we have several documents by some of the ministries of Colombia. Also, we have the Office of the Public Prosecutor that is conducting or writing best practices for addressing cases, including LGBTI persons. The project has been going on for four years and it's in the review stage. And also, there is also a project to include a gender perspective in national statistics. Also, we have the creation of the National Observatory of Gender Violence, and recently we are including uh, protocols so that data are compatible between the different databases. And also all the uh, authorities of the state should provide statistics with a gender perspective. Mexico, thank you. We have identified three best practices. Two of them uh, derived from the recommendation to 2019 that we were uh, talking about regarding the case of Kenya Cuevas. The first is the uh, public prosecutor of the city of Mexico is preparing a protocol for uh, uh, the attention of LGBTI persons, and this includes the support of L uh, social society. We are working to include the perspective of trans women. Also, we have a protocol uh, in to consider the friends of the victims as direct victims. And also we are working to identify mechanisms to repair the damage suffered by the victims. And also some of the murder cases, prosecutor offices are also investigating the cases of trans women. And um, this is to show that in some cases, the land of the Para Convention is being applied. Dominican Republic, as regards uh, Bernarda, you have the floor. Well, I will uh, focus on the Dominican Republic measures, the strategic plan 2020-2024 uh, of the judiciary, which included access to justice for people in conditions of vulnerability, including LGBTI people, was built with the consultation of civil society, although the implementation is still pending. We also have um, a human rights department that provides following and support for violations against LGBTI people. Although the victim is not identified as member of the community in state instruments as of yet. Brazil? Well, when there are dina when there are complaints we have for example when a crime is considered that is a homophobic crime it is explicitly written there but that is not enough because several lgbt plus people that go to the police stations to file a complaint usually the police officers say that they are uh, that there is lack of evidence so what we see is that in police officers and in many justice people also we see how they are uh, they they do show a lack of training because in many cases 
what they are doing is that they do not believe that what had, has happened to the individual is that they do not consider that what happened was a crime. So what we need actually is training because unlike what police officers believe, the, they are saying and telling the truth and they have to understand and believe the victims. And especially when they file the complaint, that should be considered enough evidence to start the process. And also what we see is with, with black people, this also happens and with gender-based violence, that happens too, because you need to go to the police station two or three times with a lawyer so that the justice systems pay you attention. And in terms of gender-based protocols in the justice systems, I believe that we need an even broader perspective considering gender and sexual orientation. And in this book, my friend, who is also a lawyer, analyzed countries all over Latin America, and he said that in those countries where there is a gender perspective, and also including non-binary language, which is progress for the feminist movement, you do not see that actually they are improving the situation of LGBT population. So I believe that what we need is not only gender perspective, but also an LGTB plus perspective, even though they might be complementary. Bolivia? You're on mute. Well, among the best practices identified in Bolivia, we just uh, approved a protocol for LGBTI persons who are deprived of their liberty, which has been uh, worked with the penitentiary system and civil uh, organizations. And this protocol respects gender identity, sexual orientation for LGBTI persons deprived of their liberty and also to protect their uh, physical integrity, especially in this uh, violent environment. Thank you. Ecuador, as regards the children uh, aspects, we will start uh, commenting on that and answering some of the questions you've made. Yes, in Ecuador, the main uh, victims are children and adolescents who are committed to who are in different facilities and in Ecuador and the rest of the region the violence lived by LGBTI children and adolescents starts by the non-recognition of their self-perceived uh, identity which results in uh, violence against their rights to access to health. During the pandemic, many of these children lived violence for their gender identity among their families, and they had not the, the possibility to report this. In the region, we understand that uh, the children's rights are not compatible with uh, LGBTI rights because they stigmatize their children and diverse families. Also, uh, bullying based on LGBTI phobia is constant in school environments, which means that the, these children cannot uh, normalize their situations. In Ecuador, we had to access justice and we managed to get pro progress because we recognize a girl the possibility to change her name and her gender in her ID card. But this was uh, uh, to the cost, to, in detriment of their family because they had to uh, go into exile to do this. And we seek that this change uh, can be done for all, for all children in the country. Mirta? Yes, I wanted to answer some of the questions in, uh, with regard to the protocol. We think it's important to have the participation of the civil society, the states, and the commission, especially taking other initiatives 
mainly the Latin American protocol model for the investigation of femicides. That could be a good model to base our analysis on. In that sense, it's important that the protocol incorporates this theoretical framework that the Inter-American Court has already incorporated in some cases. That is the framework of prejudice-based violence, which is already at the Inter-American Court. That should be the framework we should base our protocol on and that we should have the inter-institutional and interdisciplinary uh, participation of all stakeholders, taking into account that LGBT persons are uh, suffer other types of discrimination based on gender, on poverty, and related to other structural violences. In terms of training, besides the several practices we already mentioned, we should think of in a sort of law, such as the Micaela law in Argentina, that demands uh, a de uh, binding training for justice operators. So there should be uh, an obligation to have a gender-based training, such as the one provided by the Le Micaela in Argentina. Since this, these courses are intertwined with the public sphere, and we see uh, the consensus uh, objection, which is very clear, which is uh, usually aimed to protect those people. Uh, we should strengthen the application of the standards that are already in, in place, and this should lead us to uh, create cultural change, which is at the foundations of all these uh, issues. And in relation to backlash, we have seen progression related to uh, the judiciary in many of the countries because there is an advancement by the anti-right groups and anti-gender groups, especially in parliaments. So what we have to do is to defend our standards the standards are already in place in the judiciaries, and also the civil society should increase their work to promote this at the executory, executive branch and to promote democracy, because in democratic processes, we are taking this, we are making these decisions in democratic systems. Colombia, I only wanted to call the attention on and access to justice for LGBTI persons in context, in context of transitional justice in Paraguay and Colombia, we are not uh, having LGBTI persons in transitional justice. This is important. And second, this is related to what Mirta said about discourse. We have to recognize that backlash has been translated into the seeking of capital through hatred and hatred discourses. And this is something we are facing in the whole region. Finally, we want to uh, go back to some general recommendations for the region. And so we request the commission to tell the states that they are under the obligation to apply measures to protect LGBTI persons. We should uh, have specific departments on these types of issues to have specific training on LGBTI issues for justice operators, and that we have an assessment so that we have different uh, district attorneys and other stakeholders who are part of evidentiary assessment. We have to include information for district attorneys as regards access to justice, prejudice in the hypothesis to investigate, adequate measures based on context analysis and intersectionality. We need to promote the respect of gender identity in criminal proceedings, including the recognition of gender identities names from the moment the petition is received and during the trials, even if people are considered victims or accused. Also to work towards the elimination of violence against LGBTI persons, to take charge of the environmental, the environments of uh, education, 
and other environments in which this violence is carried out. Many times, families uh, from these LGBTI persons are denied because we do not recognize legally their union. And also to promote precautionary measures and security measures in the cases of violences, especially affecting children and adolescents from this LGBTI community. Thank you very much. Yes, I wanted to continue with some recommendation per country to end. We have specific requests for the Colombian state to have a case on reproductive health and other crimes based on the sex sexuality of the victims and also to have measures to protect victims for the Bolivarian states to review the measures of crime typification that sanctions these types of crimes to the Equatorian state to comply the Bruno Paolos and Katia recommendation to regulate the sex change for trans persons as, re as provided by the institutional court the compliance of inconstitutionality measure in 2017 to have a special and swift procedure to uh, prosecute hate crimes and other types of crimes so that transitional justice recognizes LGBTI victims and to have uh, due diligence for crimes against humanity related to these persons, to the state of Peru, we demand the Rojas Marine against Peru uh, recommendations to be complied with. To the Mexican state, we request the access to a life free of violence and to comply with the CEDAW recommendations to the Dominican Republic, we request that they update their legal measures to guarantee the rights of LGBTI persons and reduce violence and allow them to uh, have access to justice. To the uh, commission, we request an in loco visit to that country to analyze that. To LGBT Belizeans, in 12 subsidiary legislation to address discrimination and violence. We call on parliament to modify the sodomy law declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court and the Court of Appeal and apply the constitution's equal protection under the law clause to sexual orientation and gender identity to old and new legislation to finally reflect the principle of leave no one behind. Finalmente a Brasil le solicitamos la ampliación de defensa to Brazil, we request public defenders to guarantee the protection of LGBTI persons who are the most vulnerable and re relation with the rest of the country of the questions. We will reply to them in writing. And finally, we wanted to acknowledge the work of Commissioner Flavia Plovesan for her work, for the capacity to hear us. And we uh, congratulate her and we wish her success and we are sure we will keep continue working with her. Thank you very much. We're at the end of this here and I wanted to thank my colleagues from the commission, the team who is always behind the scenes organizing everything that is required. I want to acknowledge and thank each and every one of you because and also to the persons who are uh, seeing this here and each of these LGBTIQ plus persons, all the people you represent, all the children who are growing and have the hope in this way forward. I wanted to thank your continuous work. I know personally many of you, and I, it's a pleasure to meet you here. For instance, uh, Guillermo's participation in the UN. At the beginning of this hearing, I was saying that this was a very moving and very important hearing because here we have the struggle for dignified life. And also at this hearing, we have the work of a uh, work of a commissioner, a, a friend, Commissioner Fia Flavia Piovesan, who from the start of her time has been the, the spearhead to incorporate the rights of LGBTIQ plus uh, 
persons in the inter-American system. She opened the doors to continue working from monitoring, from precautionary measures, from her work before the court. So I cannot close this hearing without mentioning this, uh, this tribute the civil society is making for your for your solid work, for having made your work as a commissioner to reminding uh, to remind us that dignity is essential and as i as you said the right to be is something we are struggling for and we will continue our legacy so thank you very much for your presence uh, and i close the session here have a good day thank you flavia thank you from the bottom of my heart i'm really really moved so I send you a hug and we will continue struggling with hope, pushing the obstacle away. So thank you very much, my dear first vice president. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Goodbye. Thank you.